This show is going to deal primarily with working length and patency, and to a lesser extent, the glide path and the apical one-third. The assumption for all my friends internationally is that the axis has been cut, the triangles of Denton have been eliminated, and we've done the pre-enlargement in the coronal two-thirds of all the systems. Clearly, the anatomy is most difficult in the apical one-third. So we'd always want to use clinically a viscous chelator with a small-sized hand file. We're using little back-and-forth reciprocating motions, but when that stop gets about one millimeter off the reference point, I personally don't like to reciprocate anymore. I like to slide instruments to length. Oftentimes, students have been taught to work to the physiologic terminus, which would be defined as the minor constriction or the cementinal dentinal junction. This is a very arbitrary point that varies from tooth to tooth, from root to root on multi-rooted teeth, and from wall to wall within each single canal. What I've just really said is it's kind of uh, ludicrous for us to think we can work to a landmark that can range sometimes as much as two or three millimeters in its vertical extent. So for me, it is much wiser as a teacher to have students direct files intentionally that are small and flexible right to the radiographic terminus. We can all agree on this landmark internationally. It's not ambiguous, and we should recognize the file is minutely long. We should get over this concern of the instrument touching the tissue in the attachment apparatus because at this point in time, we're advocating apicoectomy procedures and surgical procedures to do corrective measures. We're also sticking implants in bone that are all types of diameters and length, and it's simply irrelevant to be concerned and needlessly over-worry about placing a 6, an 8, or a 10, or a 15 to the RT. Oftentimes, colleagues like to talk about working to the radiographic apex, but as you can see in this animation, that they're obviously not always coinciding. Canals frequently exit roots other than at the radiographic apex, so it's more appropriate to speak of instrumenting to the radiographic terminus. The radiographic terminus, then, would be my working length. It's very important to keep the canals open. This means patency files are repeatedly and deliberately passed through the foramen, like you can see clinically on this first mandibular molar with a full veneer crown. Notice how gentle the instrument is being used, and by using it frequently in this manner, we're transitioning the canal to a little larger diameter, we're smoothing and refining the walls, and at some point we can now decide do we have a smooth, reproducible glide path? A secret that I've learned that will help you know whether you should carry rotary files to length or prepare these apical thirds manually is to take a 15 file and progressively pull it back one or two millimeters, then three or four millimeters, then four or five millimeters, and if you can pull this instrument back and without reciprocating the handle, always slide the instrument to the full working length, you have a wonderful glide path and rotary will typically follow. In this animation, because there's a decreasing radius curvature, we must though, even with a well-prepared glide path, we might have to be concerned about cyclic fatigue and we still might want to finish the more difficult, highly curved ones manually. So you can see in this mandibular molar on the post-op film, the distal root trifurcates in the last couple millimeters. The rotary file is not going to know which branch to take and it will typically roll over and can be predisposed to fracture. In this mandibular second bicuspid, you can see an asymmetrical lesion. The importance of carrying the small size files to and minutely through the foramen cannot be overemphasized because we want our reagents to come off that shaped canal so that those irrigants can penetrate, circulate, and clean into a myriad of lateral canals we see on that second bicuspid. Notice, in fact, the first bicuspid has three apical portals of exit. I've always said that as a teacher, having done this since the 70s, I think there's really only two things left I have to teach the rest of my life, and one would be great access and owning the glide path. Because if everybody has a complete access cavity, 
with all the orifices identified, and if 15 files are sitting at length at the terminus, virtually every dentist in the world can shape those canals and operate them on a consistent basis. Let's review what we've talked about. Of course, when we are doing glide path management, there are exceptions, but dominantly what I've noticed is trouble occurs in the apical one-third. And perhaps in another show, at another time, we can talk about some of these traditional upsets. But we need to remember most of our difficult curvatures and divisions occur in the apical three to five millimeters. As such, let's use viscous chelators because they're going to give us forgiveness superior lubrication, emulsification, and keeping the tissue and the debris floated well in the viscous chelator. Using small size hand files in the presence of a viscous chelator clinically is a very successful idea. And in fact, if we're having any trouble at all with a 10, we can recurve it or perhaps even consider going to an 08 or an 06. We talked about the importance of a known working length and for me it's not at some arbitrary point short of full length, it's at the radiographic terminus. Once we have a known working length, it's important to gently carry the file minutely through the foramen deliberately and repeatedly until the instrument is completely loose. With a known working length and a patent canal, we can now check the glide path and remember when rotary instruments are spinning perhaps at 300 RPMs they're work hardening and you're going to have to be concerned a little bit more about cyclic fatigue so let's be intelligent on how we shape these difficult areas.